Everybody doing good today? Check your neighbor. Make sure they're smiling. Make sure they're smiling. Got a big smile on their face. Yeah, if they're not, then smile at them, and it will be contagious. Wow, what a powerful presence of the Lord in this room today. Anyone feel that? Today is my father's birthday. My dad passed away in 2018, April. It was just three days after his 74th birthday. He was playing racquetball and fell and uh, fell into the wall and had a brain injury. And um, he was never conscious from the moment he hit the wall, never was aware of anything again. He was 10 days in a coma and then passed away at the end of April, I think the 27th, um, in 2018. My father was the founding pastor of what became Cornerstone Apostolic Church, um, and that was the church that I led for 17 years. My father led for 19 years, and then he turned the church to me when, in 1999. I was 28, and I uh, had been, of course, apart from the beginning, and had traveled and preached for like 10 years, done evangelism and stuff, but I came back home and led the church for 17 years, and my father was there all that time, so honorable, and such a, a just a, a great, great man of God. And But today, he would have been 80 years old today. Now he is where birthdays don't count. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's like he's living in that, in that eternal space. And so I'm very, very grateful for my father. Now, my mother was here on Easter. She attends a church down in Cleburne. But she was here on Easter to celebrate with us. She likes to come for special events. And we got the opportunity to honor her because uh, really, honestly, speaking of honor, um, we wouldn't be here today if it had not been for the sacrifice of James and Linda Pixler, my parents, in 1980, when my dad rented a little community center that had been a volunteer fire hall, and they turned it into a community center on John T. White Road in East Fort Worth. And my dad stood in the window of our house, and the Lord told him that'd be a great place to start. There were a lot of reasons why he shouldn't do it, a lot of reasons why he couldn't do it. But he did it. And the Lord opened that door in 1980. In 1983, we moved over off of Sun Valley Drive, southeast Fort Worth, just north of Mansfield Highway, if you're familiar with that. And we were there from 1983 uh, until we moved here uh, to launch. We relaunched as a new church in 2017 here as Freedom Life. And uh, just an amazing, amazing story. One of these days, I'll tell you a little bit more of the whole story. Incredible miracles, a lot of heaven and a lot of hell. It's not a good story without some tension. And so we've had a really good story. But my, my father, um, he was a very faithful man. He was a, um, I don't want to honor him today. Um, it was interesting, a few days ago, I just felt an impulse to look back through some of the last texts he sent me before he died. And uh, one of them was a, just, he, all he said was read. And he gave me a list of scriptures. And those scriptures, it was amazing to me because I had no idea. I didn't remember what, what those scriptures said. When I looked them up, it was amazing just how those words spoke into my life right here today in my present circumstances. And it was like, it reminded me of the story of Abel. Though dead, yet he speaketh, if I can use the old King James Version, you know. And so it just felt like that my dad was, was speaking even into, this, even into this current moment. I felt like that as a part of the cloud of witnesses, he was speaking into our lives. And so it reminded me of a story. In fact, a couple Saturdays ago, not yesterday, but a week ago, I was praying on a Saturday night, and I was praying over this church, and I was praying over the assignment that we have and just what God has called us to do here at Freedom Life. And as I was praying, the Lord brought back to my mind a story, and I want to share it with you today, just as a testimony of faith, but also to release uh, the anointing and the authority that my dad carried, uh, sort of by proxy today. I want to release that into this space and into this time and into your life. But in 1990, my father had led the church for 10 years by that point. And so during that period of about 10 years, there had been a lot of ups and downs, a lot, of, a lot of challenges, a lot of difficult times. But in that particular moment in 1990, the church had really gone into a particular time of challenge, 
<laughs> we got a little distress going on. Pray, saints. <laughs> I feel your pain, darling. I wish I could do that right now. No, I don't really. I don't. I don't really. I don't. There are moments, but not right now. But my dad had been for 10 years leading the church, and there had been a lot of challenges. But he had built the church up, and they had a good crowd of people. But around 1989 or 90, we had come from a tradition that was um, opposed to tithing. They didn't believe in tithing. It was a, kind of a, a little small group of churches we were a part of. And one of their distinctive doctrines was they believed tithing was a part of the law of Moses. And so you could not teach tithing. You did not teach Sabbath, circumcision, can't eat pork, all the other stuff. And so it was such a big deal to them that they, many of them believed that it was actually wrong to tithe. Like you could give 9% or 11%, but don't give 10%. If you do, you've fallen from grace. So it was a very aggressive stance. Well, my dad came to understand that that was not the case. And while, of course, we do not teach tithing from a mosaic or a legalistic standpoint, we understand that we don't observe anything because it's the law, but rather we do what we do from grace. But he began to get a revelation of grace-based tithing and doing tithing not under compulsion but freely because you understand the principle of the tenth. And when you give the tenth, it unlocks a covenant authority and grace in the kingdom for finances. And so my dad began to teach that. And as he did, a church of about 100, 110 people went down to 20 people. And I remember I was out traveling around preaching revivals and stuff at that time, but I would come back home and the building was so empty, everybody had their own pew. You remember when we had church pews? This is before chairs became the thing, you know, everybody had. And it was like everyone, it didn't matter, you could have your own pew, you could lie down, sleep in the presence of Jesus. I mean, it was just empty. The building was so empty and my dad was so discouraged. And uh, he had, he was always worked multiple jobs and he had been bivocational and then it, it, the church had grown to where he could be full time as a pastor. And now he was back at the point where there was no money, there was no people. And he actually tried to turn the church to another pastor and walk away from it. And that pastor very wisely said, no, this is not the will of God. Uh, Brother Pixler, that's what they called him, Brother Pixler. Uh, God wants you to be here. And so my dad stayed and they were, I remember it was so demoralizing. And so disheartening. And so in 1990, my dad was down at the church one day in the middle of the day, and he had been praying. And he had fallen asleep while praying, as was his custom. <laughs> you got to rest in Jesus, right? So he entered into that rest, you know, that remains for the children of God. He entered into that rest. And so he was, he was dozing while praying, and he, he began to dream. And he was over, we had in our church at that time two sets of pews like this. And he was over kind of right over by the wall right here. And in his dream, he sat up and leaned on the end, like the arm of the pew. And he looked around and the building was empty. And then a woman walked in and she walked in between the pews and sat down at the end, the other end of the pew he was at. And then she got up and slid down the pew and came right over to him. And she handed him a check. And he said when he opened up the check, he saw a one, and he just saw zeros. He said, I, I couldn't even count how many zeros it was. And she said this to him. She said, this is for you. It is for what you need and what you don't need. And then he got up in his dream, and he began to walk around. And he went around the building. My dad was one of those who always walked around before church shaking hands with everybody. I mean, he was just a consummate pastor. He's shepherd of shepherds. And he was walking around. And there was just a few people in the church. And there was a man seated like second row from the back. In fact, it may have been the back row, but it was over kind of where, where D is at right now. And he's sitting right there. And then there was a man beside him. And my dad, in his dream, he reached down and shook the man's hand, as he would always do, you know. I'm Brother Pixler. Good to meet you. And this man said, he didn't say his name, but he said, I am from, and he named a particular church in, in Fort Worth that had just recently gone through some really tough scandals and was kind of scattering. Ended up ultimately the church completely folded. But this man said, I am from there, but now this is my home. And then he spoke to the other man and he said, and this other man was an older man, and he said, yes, this is my home. And then my dad said in the dream, the building just began to fill up. It just began to fill up. People started coming in. They started filling up all the pews. They started, you know what scooching is? 
they started scooching in and people started pressing in. All the pews filled up. Then people started standing around the walls, standing around the walls, and the whole building filled up. And then he woke up. Right during that time, we were having revival with an evangelist named Dwayne McCall. And he began to prophesy during that time. He said, I hear the sound of hammers. Now listen, he's preaching to an empty building, right? You see some empty spots in this room today? Well, I'm telling you, ain't nothing like it was in 1990. I remember. And he was preaching to an empty building. He said, I hear the sound of hammers. You're going to build a new church. And he said, I see them coming from the north, the south, the east, and the west. They're coming from everywhere. And he prophesied. And man, we were old school Pentecostal. I don't care if there was just 20 of us. We shouted like there was 2,000 of us. And we received that word. And so during the middle of all of that, my dad, went, we went to a service in Gilmer, Texas. And a pastor called my dad out. And he said, I see what God's going to do in your life, Brother Pixler. And right now it feels hopeless. And right now it feels like your building is empty. And you have no money. But I'm telling you what God's going to do. And he prophesied over him and promised what God would do. And he said again, they're coming from the north, the south, the east, the west. They're going to fill the house up. And it was just a few weeks later in one of those services with hardly anybody there. My dad walked around and there was a man sitting right back on the back. His name was Jim Jacobs. And he shook his hand. He said, I'm Brother Pixler. He said, I'm Jim Jacobs. He said, I'm from, and he named the church. I'm from that church. But we're looking for a place to go. <laughs> now, my dad had told the church that dream about a week earlier. And that man was the first one. And over the next several months, about 100 to 120 people came from that particular church that had broken down. And the first one to come was Jim Jacobs. The last one to come was Brother Cottle. And he was the older man in that dream. My dad saw the first man and the second man both in the dream. And that church filled up. Well, not only did it fill up from people who were looking for a, a, a safe place to go because their church had, had collapsed and there had been a lot of immorality and leadership, just a lot of crazy stuff. And so not only did they come and find a home, but people started coming from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And I would come back home from preaching revivals, and it was filling up, filling up, filling up. I'd go away for a week or two and come back, filling up, filling up. I'm like, Dad. This place is rocking. Boy, it was all of a sudden fun to have church. Because, man, it was the pl place was full and people were singing. And when you would preach, you actually didn't just hear it. Amen. 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 It was like all of a sudden the place was rocking with just with energy. And, and a crowd always draws a crowd. And, boy, people started coming. And it wasn't very long until there wasn't a place to sit. There wasn't a place to park. So what did we hear next? The sound of hammers. Yeah, in 1994, Dad started the building that he built behind that church building we were in. And he built that building and paid for it debt-free. He said, the Lord's going to help us pay for this. We're not going to have to borrow a dime. And I can remember my dad was a very blunt, very plain-spoken man, big guy. And he'd walk to the pulpit and he'd say, well, we don't have any money. If we're going to build this church, we're going to have to have some money. And so he'd take up an offering. He'd say, count it. <laughs> I'm telling you. I heard him do it. I don't know how many times. Wanda Jones. He'd say, count it. And she'd count it. He'd say, it's not enough. <laughs> we got to have more. <laughs> and he built that building and did not have to borrow one dime to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you this today because when I was praying a week ago Saturday and I was walking through my kitchen late at night and I was praying, I heard the Lord say to me, what I did for your father, I will do for you. So I'm just going to tell you right now, get ready, get ready, get ready. And then he told me this week, he said, Steve, it's time to pop some popcorn and watch the show. So I want to know who's ready for God to to pull off a dramatic finish. Yeah. Father, we're thankful for the heritage that you've given us. And we release the authority and the grace that has accrued throughout the generations. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I release the generational grace and blessing from my great-grandfather, Buck Porter, and his mother, my great-great-grandmother, filled with the Holy Spirit in 1916. And Lord, I release the generational grace 
from my great great grandmother to my great grandfather to my grandmother to my father and my mother and to me and to Gina and into this church. And I say in the name of Jesus that grace for families is being released in this house. For the single mom, the single father, for the grandparents raising grandchildren, for the foster parents, the adoptive parents, for no matter what the family situation is, for the traditional, as we call it, family of father and mother and children, I say in the name of Jesus, such as I have, I give to you. And I release into this house the grace for strong families and strong futures. I say it is so in the name of Jesus with the authority that I have been given, I release it in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? amen? How about a little more praise before the Lord? Thank you, Father. Yeah. So let's talk about family matters. Now, we've talked about family matters as in issues related to the family, and there are a lot of them. Oh, don't groan out loud when I say these. Money, in-laws, parenting, chores, work-life balance, conflict resolution, communication, sex. Go down the list of all of the matters related to the family. And there are a lot of family matters that we have to deal with. But here's the point I want you to get. You can never resolve family matters until you resolve why family matters. Family therapy will nearly always take you around the edges of the problem. Now, I'm not dishonoring family therapy. I'm very thankful for any work being done to help any uh, relationship healing. But mostly, psychiatrists and psychologists and therapists only are able to take you so far. They can only go so deep. So they can sort of move around the edges of the family matters. Sometimes they might even go a little deeper and maybe send you into individual therapy where you work on some issues, maybe some trauma that you've been through, the things that trigger you. They might have you dig a little deeper into your childhood and find some stuff. But the problem still remains that until you get to why family matters, and I mean by that specifically, until you discover the eternal purpose for which God made the family, you will always be dancing around the core fracture that lies at the heart of family fragmentation. The core fracture that lies at the heart of family fragmentation is a fracture between humans and their relationship with their creator. And it's only when that is reconciled, the reconciliation of people to God, only when that is reconciled can reconciliation flow up into the marriage and into the parenting and into the extended family. Reconciliation starts with the reconciled heart. And so this is why I'm preaching not just about family matters, just going through the top you know, 10 issues facing the family. That's important to talk about. But none of those things are going to change generationally until we build our house upon the rock. Until we get back to God lying at the very center, standing at the very center of who we are as individuals and as families. It goes all the way back to the beginning. To truly understand why family matters, you have to wrestle with Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God. You see, that's where the issues are resolved. When in the beginning, God, Jesus said of marriage, what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. It's when you understand that in the beginning, God, we're dealing with money issues in our family. So in the beginning, God, we're dealing with um, conflict issues in our family. So in the beginning, God, it's when you put God at the beginning, 
It's when God becomes first. It's when he becomes the center that then everything is pulled into gravitational orbit around him. Jesus at the center of it all. Because here's what Paul says. By him all things consist or are held together. Christ Jesus at the center of relationships is what pulls relationships together. And this is why I've said to you over and over and over. To those of you who have heard me teach on family for years, I've said it over and over and over. Gina and I, who have been married this October 31 years, we've already celebrated 30 years together. We have a fairy tale relationship. Uh huh. It's been amazing. We've lived happily ever after, but we've had some dragons to kill. And we've had some giants to face. We've had some rivers to swim. We've had some things to go through in our life. As I've said to you often, we've had some moments of intense fellowship. Ooh, I wish I had some real people in the room right now. Y'all looking at me so pious. No, we've walked through some hell. You have to go through hell to get to heaven. We've gone through some hell. But we love each other very deeply. We have a wonderful relationship, and we're releasing that into this atmosphere. We, we want to be, we, we can't father and mother spiritually everyone in the room, but we can father and mother an environment where the spirit of fathering and mothering is released into an, a, a community to where it begins to take root in our families and in our relationships. And yet, do you want to know why Gina and I are living happily ever after today? And we really are. She's back leading kids right now. She's the, she's the child whisperer. She's amazing with kids. We have six children. Elena, our eldest, who led worship today. Nicholas and Christopher, both on bass and drums. Natalie, who's in college right now. Who told her she could do that? And then Anna and Ella, who are back in kids right now. We got a pile of kids. We got our own little church. <laughs> we said, if it ain't going to grow no other way. I'm kidding. We did not say that. We're working on it. We'll build a kids program if nothing else. (laughs) The reason why we're enjoying the blessings we're enjoying, and I've said this to you over and over, is because I found out Gina could not be my source of life. She could not be my supply. I had to stop thinking I was going to get my love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all the stuff I needed. From her, I had to look to God to be my supply. And she found out very quickly I wasn't going to be all she needed. And so she had to look to God. When I'm looking to God, and she's in the beginning, God. When I'm looking to God and she's looking to God, guess what happens? The triangle gets completed. And she and I become reconciled to one another. When I'm reconciled to God and she's reconciled to God, then we're reconciled to each other. This is powerful if you can get this understanding. So why family matters is a big deal. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image, and in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. God blessed them. Boy, this is huge. This is the root. This is the source. In the beginning... God. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now, this is the establishment of what the New Testament in the Greek will later call the oikos. That's the Greek word translated household. Sometimes it's also translated family. But the other word for family in the New Testament is patria. And that means the people in your bloodline, your your relatives. But household is a little different thing. 
And this is the establishment of God's government in the earth. Now, a family, a patria, can live within a household, but you can also have in a household people who are not your patria, your relatives. So in Bible times, for example, they would have a household that would be, their relatives would live there, but also they had slaves and servants and employees and and workers. They had people of all kinds that all lived within their household, and their household was recognized as its own discrete government. Even in the Roman Empire, they recognized this. This goes all the way back to the way God created the world. The very first iteration or instance or example of the kingdom of God in the earth is the household. 2,500 years before God establishes what we call the church, the ecclesia around Sinai, when he pulls Israel together as a congregation. And it's also about 2,000 years-ish before God actually recognizes ethnos or nations, what we now call the state. So I want you to think about this then. God created his first representation of kingdom government in the world was the household. Now, anybody know what an embassy is? You've heard of an embassy. The thing that's happening right now between Iran and Israel is because Israel attacked an, an, an embassy, they claimed it was. And there's some debate over what was actually being done in that space. But it was supposed to be an embassy that Israel attacked. Did you know right now there is a diplomatic crisis between Mexico and Ecuador? Because Ecuador invaded Mexico's embassy within Ecuador. Why is that such a big deal? Because under international law, embassies are recognized as the sovereign territory of the government they represent. So the Chinese embassy in Washington, D.C., for example, is actually considered Chinese territory. If anybody watched 24, who in the room knows Jack Bauer? I just need more time. I just need more time. That was the line he used. I just need more time. I'm going to tell you right now. That man came back. If I fell off a bike, I wouldn't move for three days. And they would beat him half to death for three hours. And he'd get up and act like nothing was wrong. So I don't know what you're made out of, son. But it ain't the same stuff I'm made out of. But I didn't matter. I watched it anyway. What did they say? The following events happen in real time. You remember him going into the Chinese embassy? He got in some serious trouble for that. Why? Because it's China's territory. I'm saying to you that when God established your household, your family, he made it heaven's territory. This means you have authority. In fact, God put four things within the family that we're going to talk more about next week. He put four things in the family. Number one, identity. Number two, community. Number three, authority. And number four, maturity. And I'm going to show you these four things next week. I want you to work with me into them. Because in the household, there is a divine identity. For this cause I bow my knee before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom every family in heaven and earth receives its name. There is an identity that comes from God for your family. Secondly, there is a community that comes from God. Relationship health that comes from God. And thirdly, there is an authority. And brother, that's when the enemy gets nervous, right there. The enemy gets nervous when anyone begins to re-conceive or understand the authority that belongs in the household. When you begin to see the keys that you have in your household and you begin to understand the authority. I don't mean being controlling I don't mean being demanding. I don't mean a power-based structure where you think, ooga, ooga, I'm the the head of this house and everybody's going to do what I say. I'm not talking about that kind of posturing and posing, but I'm talking about understanding the authority that God has actually given you for your household. When you get the revelation of that authority, you will shake hell and your generations will prosper. And that's the fourth thing, maturity. Literally growing into the purpose God destined 
for your generations. And we'll talk more about that next week. you got to be here because you need to hear that. But I need to wrap up today by telling you this. There is a war on the family because family matters. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. God was speaking to the serpent in the Garden of Eden. And he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. And he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, the reason I'm talking about authority today is because many of you have been at war with forces you don't understand. And here again, every one of us in the room, we all have family experience, no matter what your situation is. And there has been an attack on you and your family. For some of you, it's been an attack on your marriage. For some of you, it's been an attack on your relationship with your children. For some of you, it's been an attack on your finances. Anybody? Who would like for Holy Spirit to show you where the keys to prosperity are in your household? Look at y'all acting all modest. Oh, well, I'm so humble. I don't want no money. Ooh, you lie like a dog. I want to know who in this room wants to find the keys to prosperity for your family. God wants you blessed. God wants you blessed. Why? This is what Paul said. That you may be in... Oh, the religious spirit don't like this. But I'm going to quote scripture at you. That you may be enriched in every way. So that you may be generous in every way. That's God's will for you. And the enemy has been at war with you and your family, with your children, with your generations. There is a, a destroyer that is stalking the night, just as he did in Egypt in the time of the Passover. But just as God stretched out his wings over the houses covered by the blood, and he said, when I see the blood, I will pass, oh, not, not, not skip you, but pass over you and stretch out my wings of protection so that the destroyer may not enter. Some years ago, help me, Nicholas, give these folks hope. Something about hearing music play it just makes everybody feel better. Several years ago, my wife was going through a very, very difficult situation with her family. It was a very, very messy situation. She was very tormented. And one night, late at night, we had been talking, and she was in a, a, a place of real distress. And she went to pray. It was probably about one in the morning. She went to pray, and I went back to lie back across the bed. Lights were all still on. I was waiting on her to get through praying, whatever, but she needed some time alone with the Lord. And I could hear her praying. And her prayer was tormented. She was not hysterical, but right on the edge. Her prayers were very fearful. And, and immediately, I sensed in my spirit, this is not just human fear. This is demonic. And I knew there was an evil spirit in my house tormenting my wife. And I jumped up. And like Superman in one single bound. Well, more or less, you know. I think it actually took me three or four steps. But I, let me, let me enjoy my imaginary moment. Anyway, I, I stepped into the middle of the living room and she was off in the guest bedroom. And I stood in the middle of the living room. This is before we had kids. And I felt that evil spirit. And I said, in the name of Jesus, you lying spirit, you have no permission to be in my house. And you have no permission to touch my wife. How dare you come in my home? 
this household. I didn't think of oikos in those days. I hadn't learned that yet. But in my mind, I was saying my household is God's house. It's heaven's embassy. How dare you invade heaven's territory? And I said, in the name of Jesus, you get out of my house and you leave my wife alone and don't you come back again. And I'm not kidding you, as God is my witness, I felt like a whoo, go by my ear. And that evil spirit went out the front door. And immediately, I did not raise my voice. She never heard me. She didn't even know I was there. Superman though I was. She had no idea I was even in the living room praying. She never heard me. But instantly, her prayer went from terror to joy. Just like that. The enemy broke that spirit off of her and the lie that he was telling her in that moment, which was a lie she had been raised to believe that she was blaspheming the spirit accidentally. That was one of those terror things that they had taught us to control us when we were kids. And that lie was broken off of her and never since that day has she ever again lived in fear that she would accidentally blaspheme the spirit while speaking in tongues. It broke just like that. Oh my God. Ugh. You people just going to have to bear with me because I feel a breakthrough in the spirit in this room today. Hallelujah. Oh my God. Mm, I feel something moving in my bones right now. And I've just come to tell the destroyer that Christ our King is our Passover. And on the cross of Jesus, He stretched out His arms of protection. And you have authority to go home to your house and walk around the perimeter of your house. Walk through every room, up and down the hallway. Put anointing all on the wall, walls and every door. And then go outside and walk around the perimeter of your property. And I want you to draw a line and say, this is heaven's embassy enemy. And you have no authority to come here again in Jesus' name. Stand with me if you will. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Oh, my God. Mm. I don't know how the cloud of witnesses interacts with those who are still alive on this earth. But I feel like in the room today, there's not only angels in the room, but I feel like the saints of the ages, my father being one of them, are having church with us today. Some of you have some old inheritance your grandmother your great-grandmother some of you had some people in your bloodline that were praying for you and those prayers stand as a memorial before God and you have access to that old grace and not only that but as you live in grace you're storing up grace for your future generations your faithfulness to God right now is going to be available to your heirs a thousand years from now so I say it is so. Oh, my God. Mm. All my Baptist friends in the room, y'all just forgive me for a minute. I'm having a Pentecostal experience, and I can't hardly stop it. And, and, yeah, my, my Methodists, my Lutherans, my Catholics, my whoever else is in the room, y'all just work with me here. Y'all hang too close to me, it'll get on you, so you got to be careful. But I'm feeling something loose in the room right now. Ugh! Holy Jesus, I declare it is so. Marco Mejia, in the mighty name of Jesus, I declare that the generational legacy that your father left behind, that you carry, the Lord will lay it like a mantle upon your children. Never fear the laying of your hands and the blessing of your mouth upon your children will resonate through them and through their generations. In the name of Jesus, walk in faith and begin to rejoice for what the Lord is already doing in your generations. Uh, Thomas, God has seen your faithfulness. God has seen your quiet devotion. And he's watched you walk through deep, deep pain. But the Lord says he has not forgotten your labor of love. And he will be more faithful to you than you could ever be to him. 
And he will bless your children. The ones you've wept over. The ones you have been unsure what to do. The Lord says, he will bless you and your children. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And don't be afraid. Even while being silent and waiting and unsure what to do, don't be afraid to declare God's promises over your house. It is so in Jesus' name. Okay, I'm going to close this way. I'm a little bit over time, but I'm going to close this way. I want to know who in the room wants to step out of your chair and say, I'm going to come and get some of that. I'm giving away some gifts today. I want to know who wants a blessing for your family and for your children. Don't wait on anybody else. I'm talking to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't wait on anybody. I'm talking to you. I want to know who wants it today. Because I'm giving some stuff away today, Jeremy. Yeah. God's not done. He's not done. He's just getting started. Out, Out of the boiling. Out of the seething. Out of the stirring comes the nourishment. Watch and see. Okay. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I bless your people. I bless every man, every woman, every child, everyone stepping forward. And those who have remained in the chair, the blessing flows to everyone, whoever you are. So I say in the name of Jesus, let the blessing flow through our family. We bind the destroyer and we say, you shall not come near our house. You will not come through the door because the blood of Christ is upon the door. In Jesus' name, such as I have, I give to you. I release grace to you and to your generations. For the Lord will make you mighty in the earth and he will multiply you. And let me also say this. In the mighty name of Jesus, I release finances. I release prosperity. I release blessing. And I say that the devourer and the destroying angel that has come to eat up your finances, in the name of Jesus, it is broken. Today, restored everything that the locust and the palmer worm and the canker worm has devoured. I say businesses blessed. Careers advanced. Workplace opportunities increased. I say that dollars extended and expanded, reaching beyond what they should be able to cover. But I say in the mighty name of Jesus, when you scrape the bottom of the barrel, there will still be more, and there will 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 be more more in the mighty name of Jesus. Say this with me, Lord Jesus, in your holy name, the spirit of poverty is broken in my house I will be enriched that I may be generous through me prosperity will flow into my generations and into those in need all around me I will be a giver not just a taker I will be a giver and not just a receiver I will scatter wide I will share abundantly for it is my purpose before the beginning of time in Jesus name give the Lord praise all right all right all right all right calm down calm down tell your neighbor calm down calm down calm down yeah she said no she's not gonna do it (laughs) all right God bless you. Thank you for being here. Our prayer team is going to come to the front. If you need prayer today, they're going to be here to pray for you. If you need salvation today, if you're ready to follow Jesus, we want you to come forward, meet the prayer team, let us talk to you and lead you in your first step of faith. Whatever you need from the Lord, we want to help you. Our worship team is going to come back. We're going to do what we call overflow. I know many of you are going to need to go right now. I'm going to bless you as you go. But if you want to hang around for a minute, you're welcome to do so as we soak for just a bit in the presence of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Can you say amen? God bless you. Have a great week.